So we're going to go through some information to get started. Um, first, we'd like to start by thanking our sponsors. Uh, NUM Focus sponsors the meetup group itself. Uh, TD Ameritrade provides this wonderful venue for us to gather. And uh, the Midas Institution at Michigan uh, sponsors the dinner. So if you know someone from these organizations, please say thank you for supporting our group. A few important points. We have uh, emergency exits. There's one exit here. As you exit, there's, an, there's a stairwell just to your right. Uh, most importantly, just don't use the elevator in order to get out in the case of a, an emergency. Um, feedback. We're always looking for feedback, positive or negative, or ideas for how to improve the group. So if you have any feedback, you can get that to us in multiple ways. You can tell one of the organizers, or you can follow us at, on Twitter at PyData Ann Arbor, or email us at the address here. And also, this is a borrowed space, so please be sure to clean up after yourself and gather all your trash and take it uh, back to the kitchen area. Um, so after the presentation today, we'll have a short Q&A session. Just to set some expectations, uh, generally, unless you're, you have a question throughout the presentation that's really short, try to save it till the end. And then at the end, please phrase your questions as a question. And we, we just want the Q&A to sort of like move quickly. So uh, keep your questions to 30 seconds or less. Um, if you have longer things that you like to discuss, then we can sort of self-organize after the Q&A uh, for discussions after we've concluded as a larger group. So PyData has a code of conduct, which I'll read now. PyData is dedicated to providing a harassment-free meeting experience for everyone, regardless of gender, sexual orientation, gender identity and expression, disability, physical appearance, body size, race, or religion. We do not tolerate harassment of meeting participants in any form. All communication should be appropriate for a professional audience, including people of many different backgrounds. Sexual language and imagery is not appropriate for any of our meetup events. Be kind to others, do not insult or put down other attendees, behave professionally, Remember that harassment and sexist, racist, or exclusionary jokes are not appropriate for PI data. Attendees violating these rules may be asked to leave the meetup at the sole discretion of the meetup organizers. So thank you for making this a welcoming, friendly event for everyone. So to get things moving, we're going to do a quick icebreaker, um, which Sean allowed me to come up with. So everyone turn to your neighbor and tell them a statistic that you heard over the holiday break and whether or not you think it's true. One third of I don't have one off the top of my head. I don't know either. Yeah. Yeah, But then CBS. What's the. CBS says 60 to 80 percent. And then they delete it. That all happened last night. And I watched it as it happened. Yeah, yeah, he said one thing. It's hard, right? Everything. Do you know why, you know why the field is this is why my you know um, say yeah, the um, you know, um, do you know why the field is statistics by watching the flies? Let's bring it back to Because most things don't happen. Sounds like you all heard a lot of yeah, interesting yeah. facts. Like if all of us were completely different, we don't want to be unique. All right. So I hope that helps you get acquainted with the people what around you. Thought? And uh, we can continue networking and meeting everyone after the talk is over. Um, we like to do a little nod to the current events of data science. So this <coughs> month in data science, um, Sean uh, pointed out that Flare is now uh, available. This is developed by Zalando Research, and this is a powerful NLP library built on top of PyTorch. So if you're interested in doing natural language processing, you might be interested in looking into this tool. And we also want to make you aware of our next meetup event, which will be Wednesday, February 6th, by Helen Odom, who's from TD Ameritrade, and she'll be talking about Privacy isn't dead, which should be really interesting. 
So um, that's already available online, so sign up and, and reserve your spot for that. Okay, and uh, lastly, now we have some time for community announcements. So if there's any activities going on in the area or if anyone is looking to hire or looking for new job opportunities, now is an opportunity to speak up to the group and make everyone aware of that. So anyone want to share something with the group? I guess I'll mention that the PyCon conference is in Cleveland, um, I think at the end of April. And that's something that you all might be interested in. It's about a week long. It's a combination of talks and uh, tutorials. And it's <coughs> extremely affordable. I think the registration is like $500 for the entire thing. If you're an academic or a student, it's only $100. So you might consider looking that up, PyCon. And it's driving distance from here. Anyone else? And if you're looking for jobs, you know, you can say it now or just, just sort of socialize that. This is a great place to find new opportunities. I have one announcement. In case anybody missed it, uh, GitHub just is, is now offering a completely free private repo. So if you're not part of a university and you've been pay, paying for private repositories like I did, I, can't, I, I went down to the free level today. So just a heads up. Wow. So glad you told me that. <laughs> I've been having my students create all the repos because Michigan students get free private repos, but they own everything. But I don't know. Okay. All right. So now we'll move to the talk. Um, our speaker today today is Claire Roberts Thompson, and she works at Trace, which is a California-based startup that works on making youth sports videos hassle-free. So uh, Claire works on combining and processing data from video and other sensors, and Trace's current products include an easy-to-use application for coaching, player development, and recruiting in youth soccer. Um, and one thing that I love about Claire is that she has uh, she did her degree at Harvard College with a major in math and a minor in physics, which is my field. Um, so now let's welcome Claire. Okay. Thanks, Patricia, for the kind introduction. Um, so today we're going to take an object uh, in, sorry today we're going to take a journey into object tracking in sports and I'll also tell you a little bit about my journey into object tracking in sports as well as the work that I do at Trace. So for tonight our objective is going to be to build a robust object tracker um, specifically to track athletes during a soccer game. So what does this mean? Um, we're going to be talking about object tracking or analyzing video to understand how objects move, so their location, their identity, and we want to specifically analyze video of a soccer game to understand how athletes move around the field. So we'll be talking about things like video, computer vision related topics like object detection, object tracking, data more generally, um, sensors, GPS, accelerometer, other sensors too, um, Python. Aren't you glad you're at a PyData meetup? <laughs> okay, so f the first question that I usually ask when I have someone suggest I build something is what, what do I have to work with? What data do I have? What tools do I have? And I'll also talk a bit here about how did, how did we get here? How did I get here? So I work for Trace. It's a small company. We have about 22 people on staff. It's a small engineering team. We have nine engineers who do a variety of hardware, software, web, mobile, backend, all kinds of things. Um, Trace is a startup. We've been around for seven to eight years, but we're still operating in startup mode. Um, we're based in California. I work remotely here in Ann Arbor um, out of our friendly local co-working space, work and tile over on Main Street. Um, so at Trace, we, we build products for a general audience. So we're looking at um, folks who enjoy what they do, um, who engage in their sport regularly, but aren't necessarily professionals. Um, we focus on keeping products simple and easy to use. Not everyone has a technical background. You know, people are primarily interested in their sport. That's, that's why they're using our products. And 
throughout the company's sort of trajectory, we've grown by bootstrapping and using our current tools and data to build the next set of, of products and features. So the question of how did we get here is very relevant. It's how we got here that's going to give us the data that we'll be able to use to solve this object tracking problem. So we started off with Alpine Replay, which was a smartphone app to track your day on the ski slopes. So this was targeted towards people who ski or snowboard regularly. You can just use your phone, you open up the app, which is free. We use the phone's GPS plus accelerometer to record data throughout the day. Then we take in that data, analyze it, and, and deliver back stats that people are interested in. So we can say things like, which lifts you took, which runs you came down. So you can see that kind of thing up here on the map. Um, we also have things like speed, how fast did you go? Um, what was your total distance for the day? How many vertical feet did you do? Um, how long did you spend out on the mountain? Did you do anything interesting like jumps or other tricks? So this is of interest to folks who um, you know, maybe they're into quantified self or they like journaling, keeping track of what they've done over the course of a ski season or from year to year. Um, understanding how often, how frequently, how far you um, spend skiing or snowboarding. People also like this because it's bragging rights. I mean, skiing is a social um, you know, activity, right? And you're probably there with some friends or you know other skiers or snowboarders. And so this is a way to say, this is what I've been doing, where I've been, how fast I've been going, so on. So people like to share this kind of stuff with their friends and family. OK, so um, sorry. what am I doing? Um, at this point in, in Trace's development, I was at college. I was getting a bachelor's degree in, in math and in physics. OK, so the next step for Trace was to expand within action sports. So we've already got this, this snow sport component with our, our snow app. Um, so we're going to add water sports onto snow sports. There's a trick here, though. No one wants to take their phone surfing. Uh, so we need purpose-built waterproof hardware. Um, so we built a sensor, a tracker. And this has GPS plus a bunch of sensors in it. So we've got an accelerometer, a gyroscope, a magnetometer. And the way this works is that you, you track your snow or your surf session. Um, and later we added other water sports to this. Um, by attaching this to your equipment. So you're going to use an adhesive mount to attach the tracker to your snowboard, to your surfboard. And so this is, this is again, the kind of thing for someone who surfs regularly or who regularly hits the ski slopes. Um, and we have built this in a similar way by, by bootstrapping on what we had before. So for snow sports, Basically, what we've done is we've, we've swapped out the phone for a tracker. Now, you get a little bit more here because we have more sensors, so we can do some, some more things with that data. Um, but it, it's sort of building on the same approach. <laughs> for surf, we need to measure some new things, but we're going to use the same hardware in both cases. So we have very um, sort of general purpose hardware that we're building specific software applications for. So for surfing, what kinds of things do we measure and how does this work? So if I'm going surfing, I'm going to you know, pack up my car with my surfboard or if I live close to a beach, maybe just walk down. I go to the beach, grab my board, attach the trace, paddle out, catch some waves. A couple hours later, I'll come in um, and, and head back home. So how many waves did I catch? Maybe I'm interested in that. You know, how long was each wave? Did I travel some extraordinary distance? You know, there are, there are certain surf breaks where you can surf for over a kilometer, or in some cases, maybe nearly a mile. Um, how far did I go? How long was I up on those waves? Did I paddle? How long did I paddle for? Did I do any kind of tricks or cool maneuvers? <laughs> so figuring out this kind of stuff, that was a large part of my job. So, I joined the company as we were building hardware and getting surfing working. So it was a good fit for the, for the math and, um, yep. Quick question, does the user have to tell it when you're starting and when they're stopping when surfing? Great question. So the question was, does the user have to indicate when they start and stop surfing? 
Um, the short answer is no. So we try and build all of these things so that they're very easy to use. So when you, when you attach the, the tracker, you turn it on. Then you head, surf, head, head out for your surf session, for your ski session. You come back in, you're going to turn it off. We're just going to analyze all that data and, and figure it out. Um, so no, you don't need to tell us almost anything um, by design. We want it to be simple and easy to use. Um, right, yeah, so I joined Trace. Um, the kinds of problems they were working on, it was a good fit for a math and physics background. There's a lot of tools that I could bring here. Um, we're working with physical measurement data, so physics brings a, a great tool set for that. I also had some MATLAB skills from college, um, and at the time, Trace was primarily doing its, its data work in MATLAB. So the kinds of things that I worked on um, during this period of, of Trace's um, history and, and sort of product development were things related to the tracker. So we get a bunch of data off this, uh, we need to clean it, we need to calibrate the sensors. Um, there's also data analysis type work. How do we know when someone caught a wave? Can we detect that event? How do we know when someone's paddling? Can we um, you know, use various kinds of frequency analysis to understand how, how often they take a stroke? Um, how do we know when they've done a trick? So again, sort of event detection and, and measurement there. So answering these kinds of questions for surfing and then other water sports too. Uh, we, we did similar work for wakeboarding, kiteboarding, kite surfing. Um, and most of this was done in, in MATLAB. So one of the things that we found was that People would, um, in, in addition to sharing what they'd done, people would film themselves and share the videos. So we saw an opportunity here to gamify people's videos. So, for example, this is, this is a, a snow video, which I'm going to... Uh, or um, here we've got a surfing video. So if I just jump back a little bit, um, let's uh, close this. So you can see some of the some of the data that we're able to add to this experience. So because we have the sensor, which you can see here on the surfboard, um, we have information like how fast someone's going. We know how far they've traveled on this wave. We can show a graphic of where they are as they catch that wave. Um, the time elapsed, and then if they're doing tricks, we can measure those and, and show the metrics for that as well. Quick question. Maybe the triangles representing the trajectory? Great question. So the question was, <laughs> what do the triangles represent in the trajectory? And so that's that's uh, was the icon that we used for various events. So for, for snow sports, that'll be things like when you went off a jump. Um, did you get any air time? For surfing, that's going to be th things like turns. Um, yeah, so you can kind of get a sense for where you are and what you were doing at that time. Yeah? Do you line it up manually, or is it possible to analyze the video and have it automatically <coughs> position it in time? That was a great question. So the question was related to how do we synchronize the video and the sensors? So yes, this is definitely a problem. In order to do this, we do need to synchronize the video and the sensors. Um, and so we started off with baby steps. Um, so if you record video with your phone, then that, that works great because phone has, your phone has access to 
uh, the, the network, it updates time regularly, and so the time on your phone when you record a video is pretty accurate. Um, so for some of the videos that people were using, this was pretty straightforward. We'd get really good timing information coming in with their video. But for a lot of these applications, you want a camera that's a bit more robust. Um, so something like an action camera or a GoPro is favored by a lot of people here. And then setting the time or synchronizing the video there becomes non-trivial. And so the, the solution that we hit upon was to make it easy to set the time on your GoPro. So we had a feature in the app where you could open it up, connect it to your GoPro, and it would set the time for you. Um, and so that, that was the way that we solved that problem in, in the case of a GoPro. But yeah, so this allowed us to, to gamify your first person video. You know, if you wore some kind of chest mount or head cam, or you carried a phone or a, 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 some kind of handheld mount, but also third person video. So the videos we saw here, the snow video, that was a follow camera. Someone is skiing behind filming. And then with the uh, surfing video, it's actually being filmed from the beach. So we don't need the camera and, and the tracker to be close to each other. Physical proximity isn't important here. So because we're a startup, we keep on growing and changing and developing, right? Um, and so we saw an opportunity to use the technology that we had and apply that to team sports. And we picked soccer. So with soccer, we're making video the central component of our product. It's, it's video front and center. And yes, there are still some individual stats. So each athlete does get individual metrics. What's one of the things that's different here is that we're now talking about a team. And we don't have equipment anymore. So our sensor that was designed to be you know, attached to a piece of equipment, this isn't the best form factor for someone to actually wear. So we changed the, the um, shape of, of the device. So instead of being a round sort of puck shape, now we have something much smaller, something more matchbox shape that you can actually strap to yourself. So players will wear this, they'll attach it to their dominant leg. We also make video um, you know, front and center here. So we're standardizing the video. So we're providing cameras, we're providing a mounting system, we're providing a tripod and sandbags. And we're also providing a, a solution for synchronizing that video. Um, we, in going from, from one tracker to many, to make that sort of easier to manage, uh, we have a smart case that can help wrangle, charge, upload all of that data. So the target audience here is, is youth soccer teams. So we're talking about high school teams, club teams, teams who don't have a lot of money or time to pay staff to film games. There's only so much you can ask a parent volunteer to do. Um, but these are teams and people who would like video. It's a great coaching tool. If you can show a player what they're doing on the field, suddenly there's a lot more room for understanding and, and insight there. People also like sharing. We found this before. Um, with soccer, it's no different. People want to share with their friends and family, with grandma who lives three states over and can't come to a soccer game, um, and also to share with college recruiters. So, We've designed this to be simple and easy to use and to make it possible to do a video review on the same day as your game, which is something that's really hard for a team with no staff. So if we take a look at what's on offer, so this is primarily video based. You can watch the whole game here if you want. Uh, we can break it down for the for the coach, so the coach can. So we can see, you know, we can give the coach a dictaphone-like app where they can record during the game, and we'll give them back a playlist, so around the the times that they recorded. For players, we can break things down too. So, um, say we can go and look at every time a particular player interacted with the ball. What were they doing? Where were they on field? If you're a player on this team, you get a, an individual playlist, um, which is pretty cool. Um, and then you can get player stats. So each player can see some, of, some things related to what they were doing during the game, as well as where they were on the field. 
So if you're concentrating on playing a specific position well, this is a tool you might be able to use. Yeah? Are you, are you tracking the ball or not? So the question was, are we tracking the ball? Uh, not with a sensor. <laughs> um, so we've instrumented the players, uh, usually on one team. Okay. Is the camera moving or is that like post-processing that you're zooming in on different areas? Okay, another great question. So is the camera moving? No, the camera is not moving at all. So we've, we've given the team two stationary cameras that are on a tripod. No one's touching it. We're not moving it at all. So this is something that I've worked on, <laughs> that my team has worked on. <laughs> um, so with the video, you know, we have these two separate camera feeds that we need to bring together. So seamlessly stitching that video together has been a project that uh, my team has spent a lot of time working on. Um, zooming and panning automatically. Now, you know, our camera covers the entire field, but that means everything's going to be super small. We'd rather focus in on where the action is. So yeah, we've spent time figuring out where's the action? How should we zoom in on that? How do we pan to follow what's going on on the field? Um, there's also other pieces of, of what's been going on here. You know, we need to synchronize all 20 trackers. Um, we need to analyze the game. So answer questions like, where is the field? Um, when was the game being played? Can we find the first half start and end, second half start and end? So we know when, when we're interested in watching. Um, we have individual data analysis, similar to before, but for a different sport. So running versus walking. Um, distances, speeds, how long did I spend on the field, where was I on the field? And then some team data analysis too. So we're interested in questions about how do the players interact? Can we say anything about possession? Who has the ball at some point in time? And then there are, are things that coaches um, like to focus on, like corner kicks or free kicks or penalty kicks, set pieces where there's an opportunity to do something very structured, or goals. How do we know when someone scored a goal? So these are the kinds of questions that I I've been working on over the last couple of years and that my team has been working on. Okay, so we've reached the present. Great, we've reached tonight, great. Um, we're gonna build a robust object tracker. So now we have a better sense of what we have to work with and what we have to work with is actually pretty great. Uh, so first of all, we have video. We have 180 degrees worth of video that covers the soccer field. So this gives you a sense of what that, that actually looks like when we get it off the cameras. So we have a left and a right view that cover about half the field, which we can stitch together to get the whole field. So in doing so, we, we get some amount of relationship between the, between the cameras, um, undistortion, how do we make this image look nicer, um, and so we start to get some information about the cameras and, and their calibration. We also have player locations relative to the field. Um, so we got GPS data from the trackers that all of the players are wearing. We've automatically detected where the field is. So we know where the players are in relation to the field. And having both of these things together gives us this really neat advantage. So you know, we, we have video, but we also have this ground truth data that we can use as part of this process. Um, and the, the other nice thing is that this is an existing product. We're selling this. So we have a bunch of data to work with. You know, at this point, we have um, more than a thousand soccer games with our existing product and more to come. Okay, so let's talk more about object trackers. So. We're using a video to understand an object's location and its identity. And both of those things are important here. Um, we string together the location and identity to get a track that represents where the object was throughout the video. And then the other part of this, once we've built it, is going to be to evaluate it. So how good is our tracker? Did we find all the objects? Is the location of those objects accurate? And is the identity consistent? We don't want objects to randomly switch identities, or we don't want multiple identities to be associated with the same object. So let's start with the things that we, we understand a little bit better. So evaluation. 
I just said we have this nice data advantage. Um, we want to track all the athletes using the video and they're already wearing GPS trackers. So great, we've just solved our evaluation problem. We're gonna compare these two different data sources to do evaluation. The other thing that we know is that we have a lot of stuff. We have two cameras and we get the videos off them in chunks because that makes it easier to upload. So we have lots of videos with different timing information. We have camera calibration so information. So where are the cameras? How do we map from image space to ground space? We have 20 or 40 trackers with multiple sensors, depending on whether one team is wearing them or both teams. So here, th this is where our GPS data comes in. All of that has a bunch of timing information and sampling rates. We have a field model from our automatically detected field. And we're, we're hoping we'll have some object tracker results. So all of this combined, there's a bunch of different reference times and sampling intervals, and we have multiple spatial coordinates in various images and on the ground. So let's have some glue. Let's make this easy. So we're going to use Python. Um, Python is great for this kind of thing. We have lots of useful packages, um, SciPy, NumPy for handling data. Um, OpenCV gives us really you know, out-of-the-box tools for handling videos and images. TensorFlow and other um, machine learning frameworks, they could come in handy if we need a neural network. In particular, we're going to talk a little bit about object detectors. So Python is very convenient for, for wrapping up all of this data. And so we, we can just use some of these existing tools to um, to manipulate it with ease. OK. So now we have data. We have a, an approach, maybe. We still need a tracker. So there's a couple of different ways that we can approach tracking. So the first is, let's say, a bit more visual. So we find a person in an image, or find an object that we want to track, and then we use the appearance of that object to understand where it goes. So we're looking at various aspects of appearance here, things like color, maybe contours, shapes, to understand how something moves. With our data, players are kind of small, especially when they're far from the camera, and they wear uniforms. So any kind of color information is going to be a little harder to work with because we can't count on everyone wearing different clothing. Evaluation is also potentially a little more difficult. We have trouble enforcing motion constraints. Like we don't want our players to fly through the air. That doesn't seem like the right sport. Another approach we could take is f sort of to track people physically by understanding their motion. So with this approach, we're going to understand where the people are in our video. And then we're going to construct tracks by using a motion model to determine identity. So in this, in this um, approach, we understand location quite well, and it's the identity part that we really need to solve. We can also bring into play really simple motion models, like um, you know, based on things like how fast can someone run, um, how fast can you accelerate, things like this. Plus, it's really easy to evaluate this. We're already in ground space. We have GPS data. Evaluation should be pretty straightforward. So for today, we're going to go with physical tracking. All right, so we're, we, we've chosen a tracking model. The first thing we need to know are where are the people. So it's 2019. We have some lovely object detectors floating around. Let's use one. So we can take TensorFlow, PyTorch. If we want something to use really quickly, we can go and look at, at one of the model zoos and pick out an object detector. So with this, we can just take one of our frames, run it through the object detector to get a bunch of bounding boxes. Now we know where all the people are. We have a camera calibration. We can map that to dots on the field. So we've started to solve our, our question about where are the people? How do we link all of these, these dots, these people together? So this is a kind of, of question that's related to filtering. People have applied a bunch of different approaches here. 
um, Kalman filtering. You can think about this in terms of probability or simulations. Um, particle filters kind of bring these together. There are approaches that involve constructing a graph that um, says something about where something could have moved and then find, find a path through the graph, as well as other approaches. So we think that these form a track. So we think our person proceeded along in this fashion. We just need to reconstruct that. So we're going to represent these probability distributions using particles. Basically, we take a, a bunch of particles and use that to discretize our probability distribution in such a way that if we increase the number of particles and take a histogram, we get our distribution back. Um, so particles have a location, a velocity. Those things are pretty straightforward. They tell us where the particle is and how it moves. They're also going to have a weight. So in our probability paradigm here, the weight is going to be the likelihood that the object is at that location. So it's going to depend on the distance from our, our dot. So thinking in terms of probabilities, we kind of get into um, a bunch of Bayesian ways of thinking. But we can also view this in terms of simulations and sampling. So if you would prefer, you can think about each particle as a you know, potential location of the object, a potential simulation for where the object was. And we're going to take those simulations and, and aggregate them to understand our, our real object's motion. And in this case, you can think of, of weight as the kind of quality of the simulation. If the weight is high, the simulation is good. If the weight is low, we think the simulation is, is poor. So how do we get from one time step to the next? So we have these velocities. Let's update using a very simple motion model. Let's, let's pick constant velocity and add in some noise for good measure. So to, to update our particle from time step i to i plus 1, we're basically just going to take its current location and add in the velocity times the time, uh, the time step between, between our instance in time. We're going to add in noise to the location as well as to the velocity. And this is going to account for things that are perhaps nonlinear, like acceleration. So this is all very well and good, and we can sort of understand how we move our particles. We need to make sure that they remain within, the, the, within our regions of probability or close to the object that we actually want to track. So we're going to, to sort of force the issue by resampling these particles when required. So the way that this works is we take our, our current set of particles, they have weights, we draw new particles from the weighted distribution, um, and then we use this to kind of get rid of particles that don't represent that distribution very well. So back in the simulation paradigm, we're going to keep the simulations that are good and duplicate them. We're going to delete the bad simulations. So if we put all this together, this is, this is what it looks like. We start off by initializing our particles. We can compute weights, and we can get the object's location by aggregating over all those particle locations. So we can take a mean or do something fancier. And then, in general, we're going to ask this question of, are the particles representative? Do they still represent our object very well? If the answer is yes, we're just going to go and update and sort of do this shorter cycle here as long as we can. If they're not representative, we get into slightly trickier questions. Should we resample these particles? Well, maybe we don't want to. In some cases, like where our object has gone off screen, we actually don't want to continue to keep our track around. So sometimes we're going to abandon the object. But if we think we should keep it around, maybe we do need to resample. Maybe we need to continue to keep those particles clustered around um, the, the locations of our dots. So we ha sort of have this larger loop that includes resampling. Because resampling tends to be a little more expensive, we only want to do it when we really have to. OK, so that's one object. But we have 22 players on a soccer field, so we better be tracking more than one of them. So how do we do this for multiple objects, multiple people? So the expedient thing to do is to use different bunches of, of particles. So we're going to set up um, one set of particles for each 
each track that we want to follow. So here, for example, we've got two people, say, and we're going to have two sets of particles. All right, so we've built this. What does it actually look like? So I'll explain what this is and then I'll play it. We have the view from two, both of our cameras. So left camera, right camera, and um, bounding boxes around all of our players. I promise this becomes clearer as soon as I play it. But then you'll all be distracted watching it, so I'm going to explain first. We have our tracks. Where were the players? How did they move? Um, and we're representing ID by color here. So different color means different person. And then we have something to do with evaluation. We're matching it up to our GPS data. And so this, this says something about how, that, how that's working. So. Um, let's take a look at this. And I'll play that again because it's kind of short. So we have a tracker. It seems to be kind of doing what we want. Um, I think we still have some questions, though. Like, is it robust? How do we make it robust? So if we can understand some of the potential issues here, we have a better you know, sense of, of the kinds of things that we might need to look for here. So first of all, who are we tracking? We want to be tracking the athletes, the soccer players on the team, as they're running around the field. But there's more people than just players in these videos. We have referees, we have spectators, we have players who are currently off the field. So, you know, how do we get rid of some of these people that we're not interested in so much? We have this this model of a field, we know where people are relative to the ground, so maybe we can use this. We can exclude people who are further away from the field, who are outside the edges of the field. That should take care of most of the spectators, right? What about referees? That's, that's going to be a harder problem. I mean, they're running around the field just like the players are. Maybe we need some, some different tools to take on referees. We also want to know something about what are the people doing. Uh, you know, this is video of a soccer game, so we've got two teams, we've got a ball, they interact. Um, you know, people, there's, you know, people are trying to steal the ball, they tackle each other. We've got corner kicks or free kicks where there's a lot of players close by. We've got people trying to intercept and, um, you know, steal a ball or, or take a ball from someone. So there's a, there's a few different things that we want to make sure we handle here. Firstly, occlusions. We have a single camera perspective. So if someone's standing behind someone else relative to the camera, we may not be able to see them. We may not know that they're there. This could be brief. You know, maybe two players just pass each other, or it could be extended if everyone's standing right next to each other in an attempt to prevent this corner kick from, from becoming a goal. Maybe we have 20 players who are occluding each other. That's complicated. This is youth soccer, so substitutions happen. Kids aren't expected to play for the whole of the game. And in fact, in many cases, it's expected that they won't. Teams, some teams place an emphasis on everyone playing for a similar amount of time. And so we want to be able to handle that. So we want to handle people coming on, starting a new track. People coming off, ending that track. And then the last thing that we, we want to understand is how well do we, do we know where the athletes are? So we've got video with bounding boxes, and there could be some difference in where that bounding box is located, which would translate to a, a difference in where that dot appears on the field. We've got a camera calibration, a field model, that we've done some amount of like automatically detecting or fitting maybe those um, don't quite line up with, with what we see in the video and what we have on the ground. Finally, when we come to evaluate, we're using commercial GPS technology, 
which has an accuracy of about 5 to 10 meters. So our ground truth data also has some inaccuracies and some tolerance that we need to be aware of here. So how do we actually address these issues? So the first thing and the most important thing is to understand the tracker's performance. So we need to evaluate it against the GPS data to understand what's going on. This will let us answer questions like, did we track all the players? Do we have a consistent understanding of identity? Um, you know, if we start off tracking um, player A, do they continue to be player A? Uh, so that's, that's the first thing. Nextly, we have a bunch of parameters, so we can tune them, right? We can use some, you know, we can set up some kind of cost using our evaluation, and we can then do a variety of different things here. We could learn some parameters, we could fit some parameters, at the very least we could sample some different parameters and see what works. Maybe we need some improvements to our tracker model, maybe it's not handling certain situations properly. And then there's a variety of other things that we could bring into play. So we talked a little bit about appearance models, maybe knowing which team a player is on based on the color of their jersey turns out to be important. Maybe we need to improve evaluation. There's lots of different things here. And in general, it's a work in progress, the kind of thing that you need context to understand. So what is this going to be used for? What are the requirements? In general, this is beyond the scope and the time limit of this talk. So I think this is a cool problem to work on, and I hope you agree. It's sort of interesting from a data perspective. There's a bunch of cool Python tools we can use here. Um, but why? Why do we care? <laughs> so because we can, because we can do this, we have the data. Um, we have you know, 1,000 plus soccer games and counting. And it's, it's something that we can use, you know, tr it, that Trace is interested to, to differentiate itself. We can also use this to improve our current soccer product. So making it easier to understand what you're looking at. So back when we looked at the, the player clips, OK, if I'm the player, I know who I am. But what if I send it to someone else? How do they pick me out amongst a team of you know, my teammates all wearing the same clothes as I am? So if we can highlight the relevant player, that makes it easier to use and easier to share. We can, we can potentially build new products that are simpler. We've just given 20 trackers to a, a, a group of high school age students. Um, they need to manage that in a busy, noisy environment right before a soccer game. What if they didn't have to do that? What if we could do this without needing trackers? That would make everyone's life easier. It also opens, opens up opportunities for us. Right now, we're reliant on GPS, which works outdoors. So if we don't need that in, anymore, can we go indoors? Maybe this op opens up other sports opportunities. But I think whatever we choose to do, sorry, um, we're going to be focusing on s continuing to build products that are simple, that are easy to use, that you can understand quickly. And we'll be doing this in a way that, that leverages what we currently have in terms of data and in terms of technology, bootstrapping our way to, to the next product and feature. So. Have some time for some questions. So uh, basically then, the reason why you're doing this probabilistic object tracking is because the GPS precision is so poor you mentioned five to 10 meters, the GPS. I thought GPSs got changed. You know, the military in this country gave up some of their restrictions some years ago, like five or six or 10 years ago. And that GPS was, a, with the, was accurate within about two meters. I must not be right about that. Okay, there's a couple of parts to that question. So I will, I will answer them sequentially. Um, firstly, there was a question about GPS technology and its accuracy um, and whether military grade technology had better accuracy than this. The answer to that is yes, there is military grade GPS technology that is highly accurate. Um, the consumer grade technology that we're using is not. Um, we're using components that are substantially cheaper and so there's trade-offs there between price and, and the accuracy that you can get. 
Um, and so yes, we're probably not using the most accurate GPS technology, but we're using something that we found to be adequate for the kinds of applications that we're building. Um, so I hope that answered the first part of your question. The second part was, is it because of the GPS inaccuracies that we're using a probabilistic particle-based tracking approach? Um, no, is the short answer. <laughs> Um, I've been talking about this tonight because it's an uh, approach that's pretty robust, it's quick to explain and to set up, and it's fairly powerful. Um, and the GPS inaccuracies come into play more when we start talking about evaluation rather than tracking. Um, in, in the sort of pure tracking part of this problem, we have more issues with the clarity of our video or um, how well we understand the camera's location and orientation. Uh, so yes, we do have to compensate for GPS, but that's not why we've chosen this approach. Actually, set up a camera in a very fixed position so they can do film study afterwards, and uh, this could be a great application for it. It could be expanded further, maybe to try to correlate between route trees and patterns. And yeah. So the question was, have we thought about other sports and particularly um, American football? To paraphrase, <laughs> um, yes, we have thought about other sports. Uh, right now, we have enough on our plate with soccer. Um, American football would be interesting. Um, Right, yeah. It it right now it's a question of, of bandwidth, honestly. Yeah. Um, so to go back to the uh, when you're propagating the particle densities through time, do you have velocities like at each position of the person from the tracker? Or like it, since you're not including acceleration, how do you get the particle to change direction? Great question. So um, we have these bunch of particles. Um, they have speeds and locations. The question was how do we cope for changes in direction? Um, so the, the model that we picked tonight was constant velocity, but you'll recall we also added some noise. And so the noise in general allows us to compensate for nonlinearities, acceleration, changes in direction, things like this. We also make sure that it does that by resampling the particles. So at each step, we're asking, does this particle continue to represent the object? And if not, we're going to replace it by something that does better. And so overall, our cloud of particles is going to follow the object, even if individual particles don't. And so having that, that randomness, that variation in our set of particles is important because we want some of the particles to end up near where the object is at the next point in time. So yes, we could, we could have a higher order model. We could include accelerations, or we could rephrase this in terms of directions and speeds instead of velocities. Um, I think, in general, it's best to start with the simplest thing and add complexity when you need it. So in the last three slides, you touched on how now that the product's out being used by people, you have a large set of data that you know is useful in the sort of work that you're trying to do. But when you first started, what was the thought process that you put into what you would gather in the first place, given that you were trying something new? OK, great question. So looking back, we have this nice data set of video plus sensor data that we can use for this problem. But obviously, well, the question is, did we have that foresight? Or if not, how did we get this? Is that? Yeah. OK. So Yes. At the beginning, we did not think we would necessarily get here. <laughs> um, however, we used tools and technologies that we already had. So we took a sensor that we um, had developed, that we knew how to use, that we knew worked, and then we instrumented the players. Because that was, that was something similar to what we'd done before. Um, previously, a surfer would put this on their equipment. Now we're having a soccer player wear it. Um, with, the, with the cameras, um, I mean, originally we did start from footage that, um, you know, so where, where you have a, a human operator who focuses the camera on the action. 
And that's all very well and good, um, and, and it produces very nice quality film. But it, it didn't meet the ease of use and the kinds of um, cost parameters around the target audience. So we were looking for something that is that requires as little of, of your time as possible, as well as uses things that um, are not too difficult to source or to put together. We want, we want to keep the price point affordable for, for a, a youth soccer team. Um, and so the combination of those meant that paying someone to film was too expensive. And so having a stationary camera is, is a good solution for that. If we can do it with a stationary camera, it's easier and it's cheaper. So it's serendipitous, absolutely. But I think we got there for, for good reasons. Um, so I think I'm missing one of the steps. You mentioned that you can resample the particles based on whether or not it describes the object, but isn't the point of the particle filtering to figure out where the object is? So how do you know that they're describing the object you're currently trying to detect? Yes, so this is a great question, um, which is we have this bunch of particles that we want to represent an object, and then we resample them based on the location of some object, how do we know it's the right one or how do we know that there's an object there? We kind of get into this circular reasoning. Um, so I'm going to go back for a diagram. OK, so um, the, the short answer is that we want, we want the particles to do the work of, of linking things up. And we're going to make sure that the particles are close to an object that's reasonable. So we're going to do some kind of association here. Um, when we compute weights, we're just going to care, is it close to an object rather than a specific object? And then when we think about particles as a whole um, and some of the other questions of resampling, then we're going to get into issues of uniqueness. Um, so you know, in this situation where we have tracks that cross, uh, we could you know, one, one solution here is to just join them up straight. How do we know? That's a great question. You know, we'd, we'd be relying on cues like velocity. And, and this, is, this is a situation where it's likely you'll need to spend a bunch of time making sure your tracker is going to produce the right answer. So we're going to control part of it by making sure that our cloud of particles has sufficiently high weights. Those weights are going to be computed based on how close the particle is to any object. And then we're going to look at the cloud of particles as a whole and decide whether to keep it or not, based on maybe some uniqueness criteria, maybe some proximity to, to objects, things like that. So yes, definitely a problem, definitely something that the model needs to be, you know, that needs to be thought about in terms of the model. So with that, I, a lot of great questions, a lot of great discussions, and I welcome you to come join uh, Claire afterwards uh, and ask your uh, questions. Uh, but let's thank Claire for a great talk.